This presentation is on um, concepts you need to keep in mind when you're creating a test that has selected response test items primarily. And what is meant by selected response is um, when you frame a question and you give the test taker options to choose from for the answer, such as multiple choice or true-false. And that is in contrast to a constructed response item, which would be a fill-in-the-blank, an essay, um, a file upload, anything where the test taker has to create the response that they're giving to your test question. And multiple choice items are the most common type of selected response item. And I liked this quote from Ronald Burke, um, the multiple choice format holds the world's records in the categories of most popular, most unpopular, most used, most misused, most loved, and most hated. And I think what he's referring to in the misused and the hated is that there is a lot of research that says these types of test items can be subject to uh, validity concerns like random effects, people guessing, people doing Christmas trees, or the items themselves being written in ways that cue the test taker into what the answer is. And um, the quote was taken from an article that I really enjoyed reading and which provided some very good examples of common flaws in multiple choice test items that cue the test taker as to what the answer to the question is. And I have uploaded that article to the IE Central team site under assessment resources and in the training materials category. So the first thing to do when you're con constructing such a test is to identify the knowledge, skills, or abilities that you want to be tested. And those are usually going to come from your learning outcomes or maybe accreditation standards. And some examples include, um, uh, this would be a lower order learning outcome statement. Select management concepts consistent with high performing organizations. And that may be a uh, program level outcome, but it is definitely at the lower order of thinking on Bloom's taxonomy. Um, a higher order outcome statement would be evaluate alternative solutions to a problem based on available information. Um, and you can construct test items that will get at those higher order levels of thinking. And your outcomes can be, should be at the appropriate level. So you can construct test items that point directly to a program outcome, that point to a course outcome, or that even get down to the module or unit level if you're giving quizzes over material that you've covered in a module. And one of the things that is helpful to make sure that your test covers the content that you want it to cover is a test blueprint. And the blueprint first will identify the learning that you want to assess. And you can assign the number of items that you want for each area of learning and you can assign different weights to those areas. And then you can identify the type of test item that you want to, to use for those different learning areas. So it can be multiple choice, true, false. Um, you can use essay, short answer, those things that are constructed response instead of um, selected response. And then you need to, um, once you've identified the number of points that you're going to assign for each type of test item, you will determine the total number of points that you want for the test. And that blueprint will make sure that your test does what you want it to do. And here's an example of how a test blueprint might look. So in the left column, the learning priorities are identified, and that may be either by making note of the content areas that you want to cover, or the concepts that you want the test to address, or the actual learning outcome statements that you want. Um, in this particular test blueprint example, they've also um, 
identified where you say D, C, D, O, K, 1 through 4, those are domains of knowledge at different levels. Um, we're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. Um, this uh, uses a different taxonomy to describe levels of learning that go from recall, recall or produce to extended thinking at the higher level. Um, so this test blueprint would identify the number of items that are at those different levels of um, thinking. And then you see a column there that has method and it has SR, CR, or P. SR is selected response, multiple choice or true false. Um, CR is constructed response where the student gives you the answer in an essay or open-ended format. And P is performance. So you may, um, for example, have a student um, complete a computer program and create an executable file format and that may be a performance that they submit to you in the test. So you have a lot of options there. Um, but basically what you want to do then is total the number of points that are allocated to the different learning priorities and the different domains of knowledge and figure out how you want to weight those points. So you can give some items on a test a higher point value and therefore a greater weight. And this, this blueprint then would be used when you actually construct the test and it'll guide you in the number of items to create and the content areas and the um, levels of thinking. And then your final step is going to be to actually create those test items. Um, there are a variety of different selected response item types, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about those. But those item types should be at the appropriate Bloom's taxonomy level. So if you're giving a quiz on Chapter 1 in an introductory level course, they could all be at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. If you're giving an exam that is a um, exit exam at the end of a program and you're getting at those higher order levels, um, that's where you want those questions to be at, toward the top of Bloom's taxonomy. And you may, in the middle, you may want to mix those items up at different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, it is possible to create test items that tap into higher order thinking and I will talk about that more toward the end of the presentation, but don't think that you cannot use multiple choice to assess higher order. Um, some different examples of selected response type items. Um, the most common that you're probably most familiar with is a traditional multiple choice. And this is an example of such a question. So you may ask, who has primary responsibility for providing financial resources to a business? And these are the choices, employees, managers, customers, owners, or bankers. Uh, assuming there's one right answer, this test item is probably toward the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. It may not be at the very bottom, but it's not what I would consider higher order thinking. Now you can go a little bit higher on Bloom's taxonomy with an ordered response where you pose a question that, um, that asks the test taker to order things in um, the order in which they would occur. And they number those items according to that sequence. So an example would be, while assessing the patient's abdomen, in what sequence should the examination be conducted? and identify the steps by inserting the number of the first step, second step, and so on. So these are the choices, and the test taker would say, okay, well, number one would be inspection, I'm guessing. Um, number two may be palpation, um, and so on up the line. Uh, but the test taker would put them in the proper order, and that requires a little bit more critical thinking. Um, a multiple response might also require a little more thinking, so instead of just choosing one correct answer, the test taker has to choose a number of answers that would be correct. 
So which of the following are viable methods for traveling from London to Paris? Check all that apply. And you have air, ferry, walk, rail, tunnel. Um, now this, the content of this question I would consider to be pretty basic, but you could write a question with um, multiple options. And it does require more critical thought because the test taker has to look at all of those options, eliminate some of them, and select some of them that could be correct. So that's a little bit higher order. And you could have a hotspot question. And this is where you ask the test taker to use their mouse and click on a place on an image that responds to a question and indicates the correct answer. So here's an example of a hotspot. Uh, click on the graph that shows a diurnal tide cycle. So this is still a multiple choice type of response, um, but the test taker is going to look at each of those three graphs and physically click on the one that they think represents that type of tide cycle and then save their answer. And there are a number of different content types that would lend themselves to a hotspot. Not every test question would, um, so you would have to use it in the right uh, scenario. Um, but again, I think that's a, a little bit of higher order. Matching is another example. And you can, again, write these questions so that they're at a higher level of complexity. I think matching questions can be very simple. You can give a definition or a term and then give definitions and have students match the term to the definition. And that's pretty basic. Or you can um, have a question like this where you provide them with examples of research questions and you ask them to choose the correct statistical test for that research question. And I would consider that um, at a much higher level on Bloom's taxonomy. Um, does require the level of critical thinking, um, enough of a knowledge of different types of statistical tests that they can determine which one would be appropriate for a given scenario. And then this is an item type that I had not been familiar with until I started doing some research into constructing uh, selected response tests. And it's called an assertion reason multiple choice. And the format is what you see here. Um, you construct your question so that you first provide a statement that is an assertion. Um, Research has shown that stress can affect the quality of an individual's voting decisions. So that's my statement, my assertion. In my class, I've covered this content, and my students should be able to identify whether or not that is a true statement. Then the next piece of this is a reason why that statement is true. This statement is true because voters who report anxiety regarding an election are more likely to vote for candidates whose policies they prefer. Now when I create that question, the statement that is my reason may be true or false, and my students have to identify whether or not that statement is true or false. But additionally, that statement may be true, but it may not actually be the reason why the assertion is true. So there's, there are three parts to this question that the student has to respond to. And this really does go much higher on Bloom's taxonomy um, for critical thinking. So first, the student has to read the assertion and determine if it's true or false. Um, next, they have to read the reason, determine if that's true or false. And then they have to determine if it is the correct reason for the assertion. And in this example, the correct answer is the assertion is true, the reason is also a true statement, but the reason is not the correct explanation of the assertion. So there are two different things going on with voter behavior, yeah. Um, yeah. and they really don't have anything to do with each other. One of those things is how stress influences voter decisions because of the chemical reaction to stress. 
The other has to do with anxiety about the election itself and the issues that the election will determine and the, be the voters' behavior in response to their anxiety about those issues. So they are really two different things. Both statements are true, but they are not directly related to each other, and the reason does not explain the assertion. So these questions can be a little tricky to construct, and if you use several of them in an exam, you would want to mix them up and not, not write the same pattern of question every time. Now, if, um, if one or the other of those statements is false, then there, there is no need to determine if the reason is correct or not, because both statements have to be true before you can evaluate whether the reason is the correct reason. Otherwise, the student would just be identifying the pattern of true or false between the two statements. And you can create complex prompts for critical thinking. And the way that you can do this is when you write your question, you can use multiple information sources as part of that question stem. So you can, for example, upload documents and have the students read those documents. Um, and they may be even documents that you've used in class. They may be excerpts from the textbook. They may be journal articles. There's different types of documents that you can use. You can also um, insert charts or graphs or images that students have to interpret or evaluate the meaning of. You could upload memos or letters or newspaper articles that have some, um, provide some background explanation to the question that you're posing. And you can even use multimedia. So you could record a video simulation of a conversation, um, say a dialogue between a patient and a doctor, or a dialogue between a therapist and a patient, um, or a, a recreation of a business scenario, a supervisor and someone that they're supervising. So there are a lot of materials that you can put into your question prompt that increase the complexity of that question a great deal. And you can truly say in those examples that your question is an assessment of students' critical thinking. Then the uh, prompts that, or the answer choices that you provide in response to that question will require the student to do some evaluation of the material that you've given them. So your choices may be along the lines of um, which would be what were what was one of the main problems or the main mistakes that this supervisor made in this conversation with the employee or um, in what ways could this physician have improved upon their counseling to the patient those types of things and then you give some choices and have the test taker respond. Um, so those response choices should require that the student looks at all that material that you provided with the question in order to be able to select the best response. And obviously these types of questions would take the most time for you to create, for you to think about. And you don't want to use the same questions over and over again, so you may want to build up a bank of questions like this over time. And um, speaking of banks, I do want to address the use of test banks. And while I, they certainly are efficient, um, there's, I think a test bank is one of those um, why reinvent the wheel situations. The textbook publisher has already created those questions and the response is you don't have to spend your time on that. You can spend your time with your students or on designing your course. So there's a lot of good reasons to use um, test banks. However, one of the drawbacks of test banks is that a, te a textbook does not necessarily 
align directly to your course outcomes. And if you adopt a textbook for a class and you find yourself not assigning every chapter of that book or supplementing that book with your own materials, so in essence you're not using that textbook in its entirety to teach your class, then the test bank that comes with it would not necessarily align directly with your learning outcomes. So at a minimum, if you're if you have a test bank with a textbook, you should try to rather than just randomly um, having a block of questions from that test pool, you should at least kind of skim through those the pool and select questions that are in alignment with your course outcomes. Uh, but you also run the risk that those test items are too low on the Bloom's Taxonomy Scale for the class that you're teaching, or um, they're just really not getting at the content that you want them to get at. So there are some drawbacks with test banks, and that's why I wanted to present this information about constructing your own test questions. You may want to make your life easier by using a combination of test bank questions and questions that you've created on your own. Um, so, enough said about that. Um, there are some guidelines that you want to keep in mind when you're writing test items. You want to avoid, obviously, tricky items. So, um, you, the point here is not to trip up your students. The point is to find out how much they know about what they should know. So, you don't want to have responses that are so similar to each other that it's really hard for the student to figure out which is the correct response. Um, you know, and I think that speaks for itself. You're not out to trick your students. You don't want to use vocabulary in your question that is beyond the level of your students. So you can still get at complex ideas by using simple vocabulary. You want to make sure that your students are able to comprehend the test question and comprehend the answer responses that you're giving to them, even if you're prov you're asking them about um, higher order concepts. You want to make sure that the STEM, which is the main body of the question, is focused and only addresses one central idea. Because if you're having your students select one response, then you can't have them do that for two or three different concepts in your test question. You want to um, keep it straightforward. The other problem with having more than one concept or central idea in a question is when you're looking at whether you're the greater majority of your students got that question right or wrong, you're not sure which of those concepts they didn't get. So it it messes up your um, analysis of the test data. And you want to avoid the use of negatives in a STEM. So um, for example, which of the following is not um, A, B, or C, or whatever the concept is. Um, because again, your students may misinterpret um, the question that you're asking and the items. It um, infuses a level of uh, possible confusion in interpretation of the quest test question that you don't want to have. And you should have at least three options among the answer choices, unless of course it's a true-false or yes-no question. Um, you want to give them enough answer choices that the item has discrimination. Um, it really, the student really has to apply their knowledge to choose the correct response. You want to make sure that all the answer choice, choices are plausible. So for example, don't have three answer choices that have to do with your content and then throw in um, because Santa Claus is real, um, because you think that's amusing. Um, you Or you don't want to have a, a patently ridiculous, patently wrong answer choice in there, because you, you, then it becomes a throwaway. 
and you might as well not have it there. And you want to avoid the use of always, never, or absolutely because that cues the student to rule out the answer choice that has those words in it. Um, if you, one of your answer choices says this is always the case or this is never the case, then your student knows, well, that's probably not the right answer because sometimes it, it is or isn't. And for the same reason, you want to avoid all of the above or none of the above because when you put that in there as a choice, the student gravitates to that. They're thinking, okay, if all of the above is one of my choices and I know that at least two of the other choices are true, I know that all of the above is the correct answer. And you've just reduced the difficulty level of that item. Your answer choices should be distinct from each other, so you don't want them to have overlaps in accuracy or correctness because that creates a situation where the student may think that more than one of the choices is correct. You want to make sure that there is one and only one correct choice in their responses and you don't want to overlap the meaning or the content of your item choices. And you just want to make sure that your wording is unambiguous. That's the absolute most important aspect of test item construction. If the wording of the question is open to interpretation and the wording of the answers is open to interpretation, then your students are going to come back to you and say, well, I thought it was this because, and they're going to explain their interpretation to you. And I'm sure that you've had that happen to you more than once, so you probably already know this. But the best way to check for ambiguity is to have somebody else read your test before you actually deploy it with your students. Just have an outside person check um, because you may not catch it, but somebody else will. You want to make sure that your answer choices are consistent in length, in their grammatical structure and their content. So for example, um, with grammatical structure, you don't want to mix your verb tenses. You don't want to have some present tense and past tense. Um, if you have a, um, a question where the answer responses are finishing the sentence of the question, then the gra grammatical structure needs to be appropriate to finish that sentence. And every item response needs to have the same consistent and correct grammatical structure. Because if one of them is incorrect, your student knows it's wrong and they can eliminate that choice without really knowing why. Um, and you want to be consistent with present and past tense and so on. Um, you want to be consistent in content um, because if an answer choice has content that has no relationship to the other answer choices, the student knows that it is either right or wrong. Um, one of these things is not like the other, so that helps with the process of elimination. And the same thing with length. If a student sees an answer choice that is much longer than the rest of them, the student assumes that length is necessary to explain that this is the correct answer, and they're going to gravitate toward that response. If you maintain consistency in your answer choices, it improves the discrimination of that item. And obviously you want to avoid opinion-based answer choices. I think that speaks for itself. Um, you want to vary the location of the correct choice, so you don't want the correct answer to always be A or always be B or always be C. And I think that's obvious as well. Do avoid the use of humor in your question stem in your choices because humor gives students the impression that you are not taking the exam seriously, so they will not take it seriously either, or they may feel offended by your levity. Um, the exception to this would be if you're not grading the exam. If you just have a test yourself quiz and um, you're not assigning points to it and it's um, you're using it as a formative assessment in class and you 
use humor, that's part of your style, um, that's fine. Um, but, but when the test counts, you should not do that. And you should also avoid the use of complex multiple choice answer formats. So, you know, having in a multiple choice question uh, both A and B, or A, C, and D. Um, because that, in, that makes the item unnecessarily confusing. Students have to go back and say, okay, well, what are A and B? Well, what are A, C, and D? And it also is a cue. If you're going to put that in there, if you're going to put one item in there that is a complex choice like that, it's probably the right answer and students are going to probably pick it. Um, so it, it just muddies the waters needlessly. Um, and so another suggestion is that once you've constructed a test in Blackboard and you've deployed that test for the first time, take advantage of the item analysis in Blackboard. And you will find that in Grade Center once you're, um, all your students have taken the tests and you have all the attempts that you're going to get for that test. When you go to that column in Grade Center and you click on the chevron at the column header, you'll see a choice that says Item Analysis. And when you click that, it's going to take you to a page that will probably say there are no item analyses for this uh, test. And it'll have a button that says Run. So you click Run and Blackboard will produce your item analysis and provide you with a link to it. So you click the link and that will give you some really useful information. So this, um, uh, these definitions here are just from a Blackboard help page on the item analysis itself. And it explains some of the things that you'll see on the item analysis. And the two most important things to evaluate your exam are discrimination and difficulty. So discrimination um, is a measure of how well that question really differentiates between students who know the material and students who don't. Um, and the way it's calculated is they look at how they answered the question and how they did on the test overall. So um, if the student got a question wrong but they did really well on the test, um, that item may not be a good discriminator of the student's knowledge. And those values are on a range, so um, it's only when the discrimination falls below a particular range that you should pay attention to whether that's a problem. Um, now, you may see in that discrimination column cannot be calculated, and if you see that, um, it either means that every student got the same score on that question or every student got that question right. So obviously, if every student got the question right, you can't discriminate how well that question tests their knowledge. Um, but that is a flag right there that the question may be too easy if every student got it right. So um, that in and of itself would, would um, cause you to look at the question. The level of difficulty, um, it'll be a, a percentage of students who got that question right. So if it's a high percentage, it's an easy question. A low percentage, it's a hard question. Um, so your questions will be categorized according to easy, medium, or difficult. And um, there are ranges that correspond to those. So let's take a look at an example. This is the top portion of an item analysis, what you'll see. And you'll see, first of all, the number of points on the test and the number of questions. So you'll know how many points per question, um, how many completed attempts you got, and your overall average score, and the amount of time it took for students to take that test. So if you look at the discrimination, um, there were 53 good questions. I think that's pretty good. Um, 20 fair questions. I would say that's also good. Um, 73 questions that are either good or fair in terms of discrimination. 14 were poor. So those were questions you want to look at and how they're worded. Um, 
did you commit one of those flaws that I just reviewed? And then 13 cannot calculate means, you know, there were 13 items that every student got right or got the same um, answer on. And then the distribution of difficulty is 42 easy questions, 52 medium, and 6 hard. Now whether or not that's what you want depends on the level of your course and the importance of that exam. So if it's an introductory course, and this is the final exam, that may be appropriate. I would say probably is appropriate to have that distribution. If it's a 4,000 level course, that would not be appropriate. And you would want to have far more um, hard questions and maybe no easy questions. So this item analysis is a really helpful way to evaluate your exam. And then you have the second part of your item analysis shows for each question on that exam its discrimination score and the difficulty percent and the average score for the item, um, how much deviation there was on that item, and um, the possibility for error in these calculations. The important thing here is to look at where the red button is. The red button over on the left will tell you this is a question you probably should look at. And I truncated the questions just to get it all on the screen. Um, but this question has a discrimination level of 0.05. This means the question wasn't very good at differentiating between um, whether the student knew the material or the student just made a lucky guess. And it probably has a low level of discrimination because it has a high percentage of students who answered correctly on that item. This would be an easy item. So this would be one you may want to look at and say, um, it's not really telling me much about whether my students learn that material. I may want to rewrite that item. So every item that has a red button next to it, you probably want to look at. And then one final thought on constructing tests is that um, I have been talking about selected response items, but you certainly don't have to exclusively use those items. I think they can be a really good way to efficiently assess your students. And I recognize that you need to be efficient. You cannot have 100% open-ended essay questions on every test that you administer because you would spend all of your time grading. So you need to have a balance. Um, there are always uh, places for open-ended questions. And what you need to think about is the learning outcome that you're assessing with your exam. So if you have verbs in your exam such as define, describe, explain, conclude, defend, interpret, or create, you have to have your students produce or construct something in response to a question in order to demonstrate that they are able to do those things. You can't define something in a multiple choice question. You can't explain something with a multiple choice question. So you need to keep those things in mind. But, um, as I explained before, if you construct your test items in the right way, you can assess higher order thinking. And you can, about, you can assess learning outcomes like evaluate or discriminate. Students can do that with multiple choice questions. And um, if you need some examples of that, I might be able to point you in the right direction. So. Um, I do have some references that I use to put together this presentation and I know you're probably not going to catch them just by looking at them on the screen but again if you want to have more information beyond what was in this presentation I would be happy to help you with that.